Of course, I'm talking about Catholic saints because I'm Catholic. I'm not a good Catholic. Like, if there was a test for Catholics, I would fail. But then again, most Catholics would fail, which is probably why there's not a test. <laughs> but since I'm Catholic and I'm a comedian, I was asked to open for the Pope when he visited America. And before you're impressed, it didn't go well. <laughs> like, I opened for the Pope, but the Pope wasn't sitting there like, ha, 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 ha. I don't know how the Pope laughs. Hopefully not like Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> but I did 15 minutes of stand-up, and then the Pope-mobile drove into this outdoor amphitheater space. I opened for an automobile. <laughs> and that's not even the first time I've opened for a car. I had to cut my honeymoon short so that I could perform at the Iowa State Fair, where I opened for Kyle Busch's NASCAR. Kyle Busch wasn't there, just his car. <laughs> I did 15 minutes of stand-up and then some stagehands pushed his number 18 on the stage and audience members came up and got pictures with the car. The car did better. <laughs> but I did open for the Pope Mobile in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And if you've been there, you know they mean that sarcastically. <laughs> I love Philly, but saying Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love is a little bit like saying Syria, a place for peace. <laughs> I lo you know, I love the whole Northeast. I'm from the Midwest, but I choose to live in the Northeast because I love the energy and I love the fact that everyone in the Northeast is angry for absolutely no reason at all. <laughs> furious. From Philadelphia to Boston, pissed off. <laughs> right? That whole Acela line, I call it the corridor of hate. <laughs> But that is why we are the United States. Think of those initial 13 colonies. Like, in Virginia, those guys, like Jefferson and Madison, those guys were like the philosophers. They're like, we're born with these inalienable rights, we should have representation. But it was the people in the Northeast, in Boston, they were like, screw it, don't bother the tea in the habit. <laughs> those English are dicks, they don't say that before a hospital. <laughs> Don't you wish you were there when the Bostonians explained to the Virginians, yeah, we listened to all that stuff you said, so we started a war with England. <laughs> the greatest superpower on the planet. The Virginians were like, what? We were talking hypothetically. Even Patrick Henry was like, when I said give me liberty or give me death, I didn't mean actual death. I was talking like death by chocolate death. <laughs> But so I was in Philadelphia for the event at the sound check, and they had constructed this huge amphitheater next to the Ben Franklin Parkway, which is a highway, and the amphitheater was empty. And I, I was up there doing the sound check, and I looked on the highway, and it was already filled with a million people. And I looked at those people, and I thought, wow, a million people that don't want to see me do stand-up comedy. <laughs> Because they were all there to see the Pope. And not one of those million people was thinking, I hope the Pope has a comedian open for him. <laughs> but I shouldn't have been surprised. In the weeks leading up to the event, there were all these interviews. They're like, you're opening for the Pope. There's going to be millions of people there. Are you nervous? Are you going to prepare? And I'm like, I'm definitely nervous. I'm definitely going to prepare. Anyway, I didn't prepare. <laughs> So I was on stage at the sound check looking at those million people and I thought, I gotta come up with some Philadelphia jokes. But what do I know about Philadelphia? I know cheesesteaks, Liberty Bell, and I just watched this ESPN 30 for 30 documentary about Eagles fans in 1968 throwing snowballs at someone dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> That's all I knew. So I went off and I tried to think of some Philadelphia jokes. Before you knew it, the event started and I was introduced and I walked out and the amphitheater was still empty. And, you know, because the Pope wasn't there and it was a Catholic event, so everyone was at the bar. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I guess I'm just gonna do my show for no one. So I go, it's good to be here in Philadelphia. And I heard this roar behind me. <sighs> and it was all the people on the highway. And I was like, all right, I'll play to them. I was like, Philadelphia loves the Pope. <sighs> and I was like, not that I was worried, but you guys weren't that nice to Santa. Nothing. <laughs> Silence. And then I heard something that sounded like booing, because it was booing. <laughs> it wasn't everyone, it was like 10%, so 100,000 people. <laughs> booing my Santa joke before they saw their religious leader who was gonna talk to them about mercy. 
So I did what anyone would do when they're being booed. I acted like I wasn't being booed. I did some jokes about being lazy and food, and I kind of got the crowd back. And I got off stage, disaster averted, and I pulled out my phone and I started checking Twitter and I saw the most angry, hateful tweets I've ever seen. <laughs> How dare you bring up the Santa incident? <laughs> Never come back to Philly. <laughs> I wish I could punch you. Bring up the Santa incident in Philly is like bring up the Holocaust in Germany. <laughs> that was an actual tweet. <laughs> Of course, the difference being that the Holocaust happened and Santa has never existed. <laughs> At that moment, there was a tap on my shoulder and it was one of the organizers. And they're like, do you want to meet the Pope? And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course, I'd love to meet the Pope. So I was put in this room with some of the other performers and we were lined up and the Pope came in and then he started greeting people. And I noticed people that the Pope was meeting, they were saying something to the Pope. And I didn't know what I was gonna say to the Pope. And before you knew it, the Pope was right in front of me and I just said, don't bring up the sand incident. <laughs> and the Pope, he didn't say anything. He just gave me a look of like, dude, I would never do that. <laughs> This is Philadelphia. They'd crucify me. <laughs> All right, that is off me. Thank you for coming out. Next Saturday, I will be performing stand-up comedy for 1.5 million people. And that's not the intimidating part of the gig. One of the audience members will be Pope Francis. That's right, the Pope. I'm Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and my wife will tell you I need the practice. I hope the Pope understands. The Pope is known throughout the world and the spiritual leader of over a billion Catholics. That's right, Pope Francis is bigger than Justin Bieber. I guess you could say the Pope is like a Catholic superhero. He's got the cape, the hat. Heck, his car is even called the Pope Mobile. Now, Pope is a tough job. We know Pope is a tough job because the last Pope quit. I'm done. I'm out of here. And everyone in the Vatican was like, uh, you're supposed to speak for God until you die. And the Pope was like, uh, God told me to quit and eat more cheese. Most of us don't even have Pope as a career goal. I wonder if when Pope Francis was growing up, he fantasized about being Pope. You know, we might about being a professional athlete. Was he eight years old in his backyard? There he is, the leader of all the Catholics. Ah, what a Pope, what a Pope. Would have been great if he had a kid that ended up being Pope. That'd be the ultimate bragging rights. Oh, your son's a doctor, ours is Pope. Oh, your has a nice house. Our son has his own city. It's in Europe. It would have been weird to go to high school with the Pope, somebody did. Somebody was sitting at home in Argentina watching TV. Wait a minute, that guy is Pope? It's not easy being Catholic today in America. It's a little like being a Cubs fan for the last hundred years. Love the team, not crazy about some of the management we've had. Pope Francis is looking to change that. Upon his election, Pope Francis didn't move into the Apostolic Palace, but a simple boarding house. Pope Francis washed the feet of strangers. Doesn't get any more humble than that. By the way, if you're gonna wash a stranger's feet, ask permission first and remove their shoes. I learned that the hard way. Pope Francis also calls people on the telephone. I don't know why you would believe it's the Pope. Hello? It's the Pope. Oh, can you hold on? I have Spider-Man on the other line. While Pope Francis is warm and genuine, I believe the thing Catholics and non-Catholics respond to most is his humility. In this age of Putin, ISIS, and Trump, it's so nice to hear a world leader say, who am I to judge? You're watching CBS3 Eyewitness News special coverage of The Pope in Philadelphia. Hi, good evening.
everyone, I'm Yuki Washington, along with Jessica Dean. We are so glad you are with us for this very special occasion here in the city of Philadelphia, the world beating up families here on the Benjamin Franklin Park. It has been a full day, both for Pope Francis and for all of us who have been following along as he's made his way through Philadelphia. We've been on the air since 9 this morning, following every move, and now we're awaiting his arrival here uh, at the Festival of Families. On the stage right now is Jim Gaffigan. He is a com stand-up comedian. He also has a show on TV Land. And then also, yes, yeah. right, he is a practicing Catholic, so it's a really perfect fit for him to be here tonight. Let's listen. Archbishop Chaput's birthday, the Archbishop of Philadelphia. Not only that, it is also Jim Caviezel. It's his birthday. He played Jesus. And so it's technically this is Christmas. And the good news is there's no church tomorrow. I've been given the authority to cancel church. It's, it's, you know what, if you could do me a favor, I know I'm going to be up here for a little bit. Do me a favor in the audience. I know when I'm done, you're going to be tempted to leave. You're going to be like, oh, the show is over. But you know what? Stick around. We've got some amazing people coming up. There's a guy coming up, uh, 78 years old. Used to be the bouncer of a dance club. He's gonna he's gonna talk for a little bit. Amazing, but you know Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia. What an amazing Philadelphia! Really stepping up. You know, an amazing uh, event uh, they're hosting here. And you know, the Philadelphia loves the Pope. Philadelphia loves the Pope. It's amazing. It's not that I was worried. I wasn't worried that Philadelphia wasn't going to love the Pope. But let's just say Philadelphia was not too nice to Santa Claus. So. Tim. Are they booing me or Santa Claus? The Santa Claus, it stays. Yep. There's still problems with Santa Claus. Never going to live down. It's amazing. We have amazing weather tonight. What a beautiful night. You know, I, uh, a beautiful fall day. I hope everyone had a good summer because uh, there's pressure. There was pressure to have fun during summer, right? It's like, let's get outside. Go out there. Winter's coming to kill us. Hurry up. Have fun. There's such pressure because summer is presented as a vacation. It's like a three-month vacation for nobody but your children. And who doesn't deserve a couple months off after the rigors of kindergarten? <laughs> I have five young children. They lounge around like they just returned from fighting ISIS. <laughs> and it was amazing. But now it's, it's fall, you know? I love how we're never ready for the seasons to change. We're always, we're always caught off guard, especially by winter. Even in November, we're going to be surprised. We're like, ah, it's cold. What is this, every year now? And we get angry when it gets cold. We, we want to blame someone. We're like, oh, it's freezing. Obama. Yeah. <laughs> Obama care. Oh, Thanks, Obama. Obama. Care 72 degrees out there. But I should be used to the cold weather. I'm from the Midwest, and I love the Midwest. But really, no one should live there. For over half the year in the Midwest, it's just like, ah. and 200 years ago, people were like, yeah, let's move here. <laughs> let's settle here. That's why they were called settlers. They're like, it's pretty bad, but I'll settle for it. <laughs> All the memories of my childhood, it's always winter. It was always winter, and I was trudging through slush. When I was in high school, I saw a photograph of Siberia where Stalin would send Russian prisoners. It looked exactly like my hometown. <laughs> I was like, is that my bike? <laughs> That's my bike. I asked my dad, I was like, why do we live here? Why would you stay? He was like, well, you know, these severe winters, they really make you appreciate summer. It was at that moment that I realized he was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> You're just drunk all the time. <laughs> I'm from a big Midwestern uh, Catholic family. Uh, nine parents. Thank you very much. Nine parents. I'm one of six kids Catholic. Six kids Catholic. 
You ever notice people from big Catholic families that are that Catholic after the number? Like they have to explain Catholic. Six kids, Catholic. As if we didn't hear the Catholic part, we think six kids. Your parents were crazy. Oh, Catholic. Then they're definitely crazy. <laughs> I have recre recreated the chaos. I have five children myself. Thank you. Believe me, I, uh, I had very little to do with it. Um, but five <laughs> kids. I have enough kids where even Mormons come up to me and go, you should settle down. Uh, make it easy a little bit. I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 6-year-old, a 4-year-old, a 3-year-old. I should really learn their names. You know? <laughs> But they're amazing kids, and I will start the wedding <laughs> at fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. It's it's a lot of kids. If you want to know what it's like to be the father of five young children, just imagine you're drowning, and then someone hands you a baby. I used to have thick black hair. I was, I was muy guapo. No mumps. <laughs> but I love my kids. I do. Oh, you know, geez. strangers think I'm unaware that it's a lot of children. I'll have strangers go and be like, five kids, that's a lot of kids. Oh, you think so? Okay. Thanks for the heads up. Hey, do you mind if I stab you? <laughs> the best is when I'm alone with my five kids and inevitably struggling. There's always someone that'll come to me and go, five kids. Hey, looks like you got your hands full. So why would you say that? <laughs> It's like going up to someone in a wheelchair. Oh, looks like you don't do a lot of dancing. Oh. oh. Looks like you got your hands well, yeah, I can still punch you. <laughs> but I love it. It's, you know, the weird thing is, is parenting, it's a sacrifice. Yep. It is a huge sacrifice. Sure is. The world meaning of, of families, right? And parenting, it's, it's an incredible sacrifice. It is expensive. It's exhausting. But the good news is, eventually you die. <laughs> Jesus. I'm eventually you die. That joke too. <laughs> and in full disclosure, my wife does 90% of the work, and the 10% I do feels like too much. You know? Like I'm getting ripped off. 10% of five kids. I'm in charge of one kid for half a day. <laughs> I'm like a single mom. But my wife is amazing. She really is. She is she's inexhaustible. She really is. And even in the most chaotic moments, even in the most chaotic moments, I will still catch her looking at me with with a glance that can only be described as regret. <laughs> but she's Catholic, so there's no quit in the teeth. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> My wife is very Catholic. She's a Shiite Catholic. And she is amazing. She's very thin and attractive. Uh, I look like I had two wives and I ate one of them. Oh. <laughs> but we do everything together. She's my writing partner. She's brilliant. She's uh, creative, intelligent. I can't read her handwriting. <laughs> she's my phone label. She is. But when we rent a car, I won't let her drive. And that's not sexism. I just don't want to die. Oh. But she can drive my kids around. I don't care about that. Oh. But if I'm in the car, uh uh. Probably the most impressive thing my wife can do is her ability to remember absolutely every horrible thing I've ever done. And she'll just bring it up. We'll be watching TV and she'll be like, remember that time you humiliated me when went out to dinner? Now I do. <laughs> I must have blocked it out searching for self-esteem. I don't want to misrepresent her. She's very forgiving. It's just the forgetting part. Right? I mean, we all aspire to be forgiving. You know, Pope John Paul II forgave the guy who tried to assassinate him. I mean, granted, he was the Pope. That's how you could be like, let's torture this guy. But he forgave him. He went to his jail cell and forgave the guy. I mean, then he left. It's not like then he lived with the guy. <laughs> like if Pope John Paul II lived with the guy, would have seen how long that forgiveness would have lasted. <laughs> you turn into the dishes. Did you shoot me? I think it's always your turn to do the dishes. Bless you, my son. Pope, we have the Pope coming here. The Pope. Unbelievable. Any, any Pope Francis is coming. Any other Pope's coming? There's only one Pope. It's amazing. And the Pope 
Do you think when Pope Francis was a little kid, he fantasized about eventually becoming Pope? Was he in his backyard in Argentina? Like, how we might have been being a professional athlete? Was he like, there he is, the leader of all the Catholic? Because <laughs> having a kid that is Pope, that would be the ultimate bragging rights, right? It's like, oh, your son's a doctor? Yeah, ours is Pope. Uh, <laughs> your son has his own house? Yeah, ours has his own city. <laughs> it's in Europe. Francis, I love when he's on. Oh, he's on one together. There's no doubt about that. His wife's name is Jeannie, and I haven't seen her yet, but I understand when he's on tour, he likes to take uh, his entire family with him. So I'm sure they would definitely give Jim Gaffney on stage. 